the Lancaster Canal passes through some of the most beautiful and spectacular scenery of any canal in Britain, with views on a grand scale of the Pennines, the Lakeland Hills and across Morecambe Bay. It's been cut off from the rest of the canal system for its entire life until the opening of the Millennium Ribble Link in 2002. As a result, it's culturally quite different from anywhere else on the system. It's populated almost entirely by highly polished wide beam cruisers that never go through locks. And naturally, there are some local anxieties about the changes that the link will bring. To understand why the canal was built, you first have to understand the position in the 18th century of the prosperous town and port of Lancaster. That prosperity had been built on commodities like sugar and, I'm afraid, on slavery. Then came the Industrial Revolution and Lancaster port found itself on the main line between Lancashire's industry and the Americas and it was now handling goods like raw cotton coming in and manufactured goods going out. But transatlantic shipping got bigger. As ships grew in size, the navigational difficulties of the Loon estuary posed a real threat to the port. Meanwhile, Liverpool was growing in size and importance to the south. To remain competitive, the Lancaster merchants built a new docks here at Glasson and they commissioned James Brindley to make a new survey for a canal. But the canal scheme did not attract enough support in the town and the idea was dropped. Some 20 or so years later, in changed commercial circumstances, Rennie was asked to re-survey the canal idea. There were now two new factors in the equation. Limestone was needed for West Lancashire's agriculture and coal for its growing industry. Rennie's proposed wide beam navigation ran from the limestone quarries around Kendall and Milnthorpe to the coal fields of West Houghton near Bolton and there was to be a link to the new docks at Glasson. Construction started in 1792 but the project was dogged with financial difficulties right from the start. By the turn of the century only the southern section from Walton Summit to Wigan and the middle section from Preston to Tewitfield had been completed, the two sections being linked by a temporary tramway. By 1826 the canal was through to Kendall and the branch to Glasson Dock was open. But those northern and southern sections never were joined together by water and the temporary tramway continued. It crossed the River Ribble here at Avonham on a wooden trestle bridge and that continued in operation until the last coal wagon rumbled across it in 1862. The bridge remained and it served as a footbridge until Preston Corporation had it rebuilt as a replica in precast concrete in the 1960s. In 1979, John Whitaker, a member of the Lancaster Canal Boat Club, put forward the idea of a link via Savick Brook, the Ribble Estuary and the River Douglas to Tarleton on the Rufford branch of the Leeds and Liverpool. The Ribble Link Trust was formed in 1984 to promote the idea. A modified version of that original scheme was built as a millennium project and the story of its construction is the subject of a completely separate video from Video Active. The Millennium Ribble Link was officially opened in 2002 by the then Minister for the Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs, Margaret Beckett. We had hoped to cruise to Tarleton, but 12 days ago a major breach occurred on the main line of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal at Parbold, completely cutting off access to the Rufford Arm and of course to the Millennium Ribble Link. Vaughan Jones was at the heart of BW's response to this problem. Vaughan, can you tell us what was the scale of this incident? We actually lost something like 27 miles worth of water. So I dread to, I wouldn't even guess at how many millions of gallons that must have been. That uh, must certainly have felt like an earthquake as it, as it was happening. 
Uh, it immediately affected 57 boats in total, um, all of which uh, we hope we've now made arrangements uh, to rescue. We are currently craning people around the breach from uh, the two uh, craneage sites that we have. Obviously our first priority was to get people home who were in the middle of their holidays or had to get back to work or hospital appointments or whatever. And then if we can pe help people out with their holidays, we're very glad to do so. And that will invol involve in total some 80 boats. I see. Well, thank you very much indeed. In the run-up to our boat being craned, we had a number of calls from Vaughan as he managed this dynamic and difficult situation. He was always polite and always helpful. He told me he had had something like 400 phone calls, mostly with boaters who were patient and understanding, but some who were less so. Tarleton is a fascinating sort of a place for anyone interested in boats. There's always something going on here. Skippers leaving Tarleton for the Ribble Link should seek the advice of the lock keeper, Harry, who is one of the characters of the North Western Waterways and much respected for his knowledge and experience. We asked him how long he's been looking after the lock. The, the lock's always been, for years, been done by the boat yard, now around the boat yard, that's how it is. I see. I've been here all my life so far, well, for two years in the army. <laughs> No, I suppose I've been doing it now. Well, my father did it and my grandfather before me, so yeah. I've been doing it for 40 odd years. Oh, right. <laughs> so I said yes and I went on a course to learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen minutes before we were due to set off and there was no water over the bottom sill of the lock but the tide rushes in here at an astonishing rate. And as soon as there was enough water, we were off. You need to have a powerful engine to punch against that incoming tide. Our boat, which can do eight knots, was only crawling along relative to the bank. This was a big tide, about nine metres, and that meant that we should be able to make it to the Millennium Ribble Lake in one hop. As the Douglas widened out and the tidal current abated, we began to feel more comfortable and settled down to enjoy our crossing, which takes about two hours. the confluence of the River Douglas and the Ribble, a long sandbar stretches out from the eastern shore. The end of it is marked by a beacon known as Five Mile Perch. All boats must go around the beacon, tempting as it may be to cut the corner. When you enter the Ribble, it can get quite choppy if there's a westerly or northwesterly breeze, and there's quite a lot of traffic in this tidal estuary. On the opposite bank are the works and airfield of British Aerospace. There are beacons, known as perches, every mile from the entrance to Preston Riversway Dock. So this one is four mile perch. A sign marks the entrance to Savick Brook and the Millennium Ribble Link.
If the timings have worked out correctly, you will have enough water to sail over the tide gate. Here you are greeted by the British Waterways crew that will help you to work up the link. You may have to tie up at the floating pontoon to wait for the tide to fall enough for you to get under Blackpool Road Bridge and the low pipe bridge that follows it. Savick Brook is narrow and it twists and turns on its way to Lock 2. Once through this, you are above the effects of the tide and can relax. Great care has been taken to look after the environment. The locks have fish passes built around them and woven willow has been used as bank protection to allow small mammals to burrow behind it. The Millennium Ribble Link operates on a one-way working basis, with boats going up on certain designated tides and down on others. Such is the popularity of this new waterway that passages up and down must be booked several months in advance. Above Lock 5, the canal passes under two culverts, first under the railway and then under a local link road, into a turning basin. Here, you have to virtually turn back on yourself to enter the steep three-rise staircase that appears over your left shoulder. Alternatively, you can go up the staircase in reverse, which is what our accompanying boat, Blue Hedgehog, chose to do. The three-rise is overlooked by gauging the ripple, for this is the official name given to the three times life-size wooden statue commissioned from local sculptor Thompson Dagnall. But the statue is known by all and sundry as the Weeing Man. And so it was with a sense of considerable achievement that we completed our journey up the Millennium Ribble Link, arriving in this very attractive holding basin at the top. It seems a pleasant enough place for an overnight mooring, but apparently there have been a lot of problems here with boat vandalism, so we chose to move on. Just beyond the bridge is the Lancaster Canal itself. We're going to turn right and explore the short section down to the present-day terminus just above Preston. The Rennie style is immediately apparent with the stone, flattened circular arch bridges and Rennie's hallmark, the triple keystone. Beautifully cared for gardens make this approach into Preston a blaze of colour. The canal enters a cutting with the garden steeply terraced down to the water. At Cadley there's a new sanitary station with showers but you'll need an electronic fob key obtainable from BW to operate it. There's a side arm to a boatyard with all the usual facilities and then the canal just stops about a mile and a half short of its original terminus. This definitely is not a safe place to leave your boat, even for a quick shopping trip. If you want to visit Preston with its newly afforded city status, the best place to do it from is Preston Riversway Dock on the Ribble. And for many boaters making the crossing, there will be an enforced night stop here anyway. Preston grew on the crest of the Industrial Revolution and the cotton magnates bequeathed some fine buildings notably the Town Hall and the Harris Library and Museum. There's a lovely Victorian covered market whose origins go back at least to the time that the canal was built. In Winkley Square there's a fine collection of Georgian and Edwardian property this was the place to live for Preston's gentry and it's not difficult to imagine how life must have been at the height of the town's prosperity. From its junction with the Millennium Ribble Link, the canal heads west in a four-mile detour built with the intention of servicing the Fleetwood coast. 
Almost immediately, it passes the Preston Sports Arena, a wonderful new facility enjoyed by Lancaster University and the whole community. Soon, the canal is in open countryside, the towpath being much used for pleasant Sunday afternoon walks. The massive Springfields plant manufactures fuel rods for our nuclear power stations. The small cluster of buildings on the left is the remnants of Lear Town, a settlement once occupied by the Normans. The canal starts to swing north, passing Selwick Hall, which isn't open to the public. Selwick Wharf once served the market town of Kirkham. It's now a popular mooring spot. Beyond, the canal enters a tree-lined cutting for the next half mile or so. The Hand and Dagger pub does a wide range of reasonably priced food and has several guest ales on tap. Bridge 27 is also known as Six Mile Bridge. A nearby milestone confirms that you are now six miles from the original terminus in Preston. The M55 motorway is quite intrusive in noise terms over a longish stretch as the canal now turns eastwards and runs parallel to it. The masts of an MOD communications centre are just visible to the west through the pollen-laden air. Pendle Marine and Bumble's Boat Shop are busy and attractive family businesses housed in old canal cottages and stables at Swillbrook. Swillbrook House was once a school and it's said to be haunted by the spirit of a child who died in a trap set by her father but intended for her unfaithful mother. The Running Pump pub name testifies to the marshy ground around Catforth, a mile or so from the canal. One of Catforth's most renowned residents was Meg Shelton, the filed witch. She was renowned for her supposed ability to be able to turn herself into animals, and she's said to have lived off stolen milk and boiled groats. She met her death one night when she was crushed between the wall of her cottage and a barrel. She was buried in nearby Woodplumpton churchyard by torchlight in 1705, and legend has it that three times she scratched her way to the surface. Eventually she was reburied face down and this boulder placed over the grave to keep her there. Pat and Ted Jackson have developed Moonsbridge Marina from a farmer's field over the last 10 years. It provides moorings for a hundred boats, but in spite of that and several other new marinas, the Lancaster is still desperately short of mooring space. Two out of three original swing bridges remain on the canal. This one at Hollowforth is normally left in the open position. It's easy to miss Hollowforth Aqueduct from above, but take the trouble to go below and you find a fascinating triple culvert construction. There's an elevated walkway taking the footpath through the northernmost culvert. Symbolically, I suppose, as we cross into the wire district, an army of electricity pylons strings a cat's cradle of wires across the countryside. So much for the age of the environment. 
The approaching sun umbrella evokes memories of boating in hotter climes. This glorious week in August turned out to break all British records with the thermometer climbing to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Over to the east, faintly at first, but getting more definite as we approach Billsborough, the western escarpment of the Pennines solidifies out of the heat haze. The village of Billsboro is mentioned in Doomsday. Owned by the Wilkinson family, the award-winning Guy's Thatched Village is a recent private canal-side development. Based around a successful Italian restaurant, Guy's has developed into a spot where the entire family can spend the day. It's themed as oldie worldy and has shops, craft workshops, sports facilities, food and accommodation. There are many other pubs and hotels in the village, all aimed at the motorist on the A6, which carves its way through the centre and is almost the raison d'etre for this attractive little community. The Brock Aqueduct is the first major river crossing since leaving Preston, but in this hot, dry summer, the water has all but disappeared from the stony bed. ducks, the unsung heroes of our canals. Whereas the majestic swan needs a long runway, Mr Duck does a vertical takeoff. At this point there's an uninterrupted view of the Boland Fells, Parlick and Fair Snape. Hidden in the trees on the towpath side, this strange device is a wellhead for a water borehole. In the 19th century, a regular passenger packet boat service took just eight hours to travel from Preston to Kendal. This house has been converted from a former stable, the pair of horses being changed every four miles to enable them to keep up their steady gallop of ten miles an hour. We'll learn more about this later on. The canal now crosses the River Calder on yet another aqueduct. During construction it was necessary to lower the level of the riverbed by constructing a dam. We couldn't work out why water was being penned up to the level of the top of the arch. The canal, the A6, the M6 and the West Coast Main Line all run parallel to the western edge of the Pennine Hills. The former print works at Catterall used to be the biggest in the county, with hundreds of people employed here. Beyond, there's a feeder entering the canal from the River Calder. The present-day coal yard, now supplied by road of course, was once a coal wharf. Greenhall Castle, on private land, was built by the Earl of Derby in 1490 and was held for the King during the Civil War. In fact, it was almost the last place to hold out against the parliamentary forces. We now skirt around a place called Bonds, on the outskirts of Garstang. There's an explosion of new housing development going on from here right through to Garstang itself. The aqueduct crossing the river wire is truly majestic. The single arch carries a trough that's 100 feet long, some 30 feet above the river below.
Just beyond lies Garstang Basin. The old tithe barn, now a restaurant, predates the canal by over a hundred years, and unusually, it's built of brick. It's only a couple of minutes' walk into the old market town. In the centre of the marketplace stands the cross. No one seems to know when or how the arms disappeared from it. It was erected in 1887 to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. The present town hall was built in the 1930s to replace an 18th century building that was destroyed by fire. There's a street market held in front of it every Thursday. A building of special interest is the Arts Centre. Built in the 17th century, it was the Grammar School until that closed in the 1930s. The rather ornate pipe bridge carries water from Harnaker Reservoir to Blackpool and the Fylde. Garstang is one of the major boating centres on the Lancaster Canal. Three large marinas follow in quick succession, populated almost entirely by wide-beam cruisers of the Freeman variety. <laughs> the air hangs thick with the smell of varnish and silicone wax. The canal continues to wind through the countryside, hugging the 70-foot contour. The canal sides are rich with yellow flag, water lily and water mint. A few miles to the offside are the windswept fells of the Forest of Boland, which rise to 561 metres at Ward's Stone. A vast residential caravan park occupies the best part of half a mile on the offside bank. Edward Lear springs to mind. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. This popular mooring site is quiet and peaceful in the late afternoon sunshine. But it hasn't always been so. Behind me on the opposite side of the canal is Ratcliffe Wharf and that once played an important part in the economics of the Lancaster Canal. Those grassy mounds that you see there are in fact the remains of old lime kilns. The discovery of the fantastic improvement that lime could make to acid soils brought about a farming revolution. Limestone, the coal required to burn it and the resulting quicklime became important cargoes on the Lancaster Canal so that wharf would once have been thronging with boats bringing in the raw materials and taking out the finished goods. The black of the coal and the white of the lime gave this canal its popular nickname, the black and white. Over to the right is LL Grange, home to an international religious sect. The small basin at Richmond Bridge was constructed for the transshipment of stone from the nearby quarry, which is now disused.
The elegant building at Hay Carr was first documented in the 1730s, when it was quite a modest property. But it's been continuously developed, most recently in 2002, when the present owners won a Lancashire Design Award for a new summer house. The Ornate Bridge was built this way to be in keeping with the LL Grange property, whose land it connects. The next bridge along is Double Bridge. The bridge was to lie at the boundary between two farms, so the canal company had to build a double bridge with accesses divided by a wall up the centre. The junction with the Glasson branch is marked by a beautifully proportioned Rennie towpath bridge. The six locks descend gently to the sea, following the line of the River Conder, which runs into the River Loon at Glasson. The bottom gates are fitted with clouds rather than paddles, reminiscent of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. During the Second World War, the Glasson Arm was seen as a potential access route for an invading army, and so was defended. At Lock 3, we found a BW crew repairing a broken paddle spindle. They quickly moved aside to let us through and then helped us to work the lock. Close to Bridge 4 is Thurnham Hall, which has been the ancestral home of the Dalton family since 1550. It's now a country club. Thurnham Mill by Lock 6 was purchased by the canal company in order to obtain its right to take water from the River Conder and divert it into the canal. The old mill's been restored and is now a hotel and restaurant. The operating sluices for the mill race are still in place. There's a long straight from Lock 6 down to Glasson Dock itself. The canal ends at the 200 acre Glasson Basin, which is operated by BW. Built to accommodate 200 tonne coastal vessels, it now contains an eclectic mixture of seagoing and inland craft in the large boatyard. On the far side of the basin are the British Waterways visitor moorings. Craft which moor against the northern quay should be prepared for a fair amount of wave buffeting, depending on the wind conditions. The outer basin operates as a port under the control of the Port of Lancaster. These building materials are loaded for the Isle of Man on a regular daily basis. The outer dock's protected by a tide gate which lowers onto the seabed when not in use. The inner and outer basins are separated by a lock with a busy road crossing it on a swing bridge. Glasson Dock was one of the great shipbuilding centres of the 19th century, producing hundreds of wooden ships just like this one modelled in the Lancaster Maritime Museum. The village has grown up around the dock. Folk travel for miles for the legendary fish and chips in the Dalton pub. The smoked fish and meat products from the smokery are absolutely exquisite. And a couple of them trout fillets, please. Mm. One back. No, two back. Two back. The local loon caught smoked salmon are a speciality, but their kippers are out of this world. Back on the main line of the canal, we head north towards Lancaster. Galgate is currently the regional office for British Waterways, and there are more of the posh loos that we've now come to expect on this canal. These have laundrette facilities as well. The smell of good Welsh steam coal drifting across the canal drew our attention to a small open boat that we would otherwise have missed. It's the last place on earth that we would have expected to find a working steam beam engine. It's um, a new engine. It's a double, what they call a double walking beam. It was taken from an idea from the pedal steamers from New York on the Hudson River. If it was doing maximum speed, it would do about um, two horsepower. 
Normally I'll be running at around half a horsepower. Okay, I'm going forward now. I hope I haven't picked up too many weeds. Reversing a bit. She's quite difficult to steer. I think this is it. I can go forward now, settle down. And this is my sort of normal speed. I just paddle slowly along very comfortably. Galgate village is dominated by the railway, which passes above it on a tall, slender viaduct. The mill to the east of the town was once the oldest working silk mill in England and has now been converted into industrial units. The main line of the canal crosses the River Conda before entering another pleasant rural section. The double height bridge forms a majestic gateway to the southern end of Burrow Heights Cutting, more familiarly known as Deep Cutting. It's up to 10 metres deep and over 2 kilometres long and was built through glacial deposits in order to avoid a long detour. Brant Beck is crossed on an unusual semicircular aqueduct. Much of the woodland alongside was originally planted with larch to provide timber for canal related works. Some of the larch remain, characterised by their swooping branches, curved needles, and tiny cones. At the northern end of Deep Cutting, there's a splendid view to Lancaster Castle. Bargees knew this as Hangman's Corner, although the reason for this is unclear. The theory that it's because condemned prisoners were exercised here seems unlikely. The houses to the left enjoy splendid views across the fields to the right. We're now approaching Lancaster itself and pass underneath the West Coast Main Line again. The old packet boathouse was used for repairing the boats the building held two boats with workshops above. The skewed front enabled the boats to be launched across the canal. A hoist could lift boats to the upper floors. This is a former BW maintenance yard. Lancaster is a university city and these canal side apartments are halls of residence. They're built around two former canal transshipment basins that were at one time roofed over. The Waterwich Public House again used to be stables for the packet boat horses. Waterwich was the name of one of the packet boats. Just here is the best place to moor to explore the beautiful old city of Lancaster. The superbly preserved medieval castle, first fortified in Roman times, is still a working building. Behind the impressive gate is Lancaster Prison. The Witch's Tower is named after the Pendle Witches, who were believed to have been responsible for the murder by witchcraft of as many as 17 people. The trial of the Pendle Witches took place at Lancaster Assizes in 1612. It resulted in the execution of eight women and two men. The castle still used as a county court, 
and special permission and adherence to strict guidelines were required to obtain these pictures. The walls of the courtroom are lined with a unique collection of around 600 heraldic shields. In the Round Tower, there are dungeons where criminals languished. The notion that these prisoners were removed from these cells and taken walkies along the canal bank to Hangman's Corner seems, well, bizarre. There's a black museum of atrocious-looking instruments of restraint and torture. <laughs> Most of these sites can be seen by guided tours which are operated throughout the year. Alongside the castle is the ancient Priory Church of St Mary the Virgin, which is about a thousand years old. Inside, exquisitely carved medieval choir stalls and superb tapestries are among its treasures. The most obvious feature on the Lancaster skyline is the Ashton Memorial, a neoclassical folly built in the early part of the 20th century by Lord Ashton, the linoleum manufacturer in memory of his wife. It's now used to house public exhibitions. And you can get married here. Down at the riverside, St George's Quay reveals another side to Lancaster's past, when great ships unloaded their cargoes here. The Richard Gillow designed Customs House on the quay is now the award-winning Maritime Museum. Inside, there's a full-size mock-up of one of the Lancaster Canal packet boats. The service ran for 13 years until the opening of the Lancaster and Carlisle Railway in 1846. The splendid display includes photographs of the boats. There's so much more to see in Lancaster, but we must move on. Heading north, the canal passes former mills, many of which have been put to new use as offices and housing. After a couple of miles, the canal turns left into the bulk aqueduct over a main road. Rennie's original stone structure was replaced in 1961 to allow road widening. The canal continues along a huge embankment to the greatest engineering undertaking on the whole navigation, the Loon Aqueduct. Even by today's standards, it's a breathtaking sight. It's 600 feet long and 60 feet high. The five semicircular arches are built on wooden piles which are sunk 20 feet into the river bed. It was designed by Rennie, of course, and built by another Scot, Alexander Stevens, who unfortunately died before it was finished. Construction work was completed by his son. Whew, that's a long way up from down there. The channel across the aqueduct is semicircular and it's lined with puddled clay that's said to be a yard thick. The bottom of the trough is some seven to eight feet below us here, and it contains a plug which can be pulled out to empty the aqueduct into the river below for maintenance. The construction was completed in 1797 at a total cost of some 48,000 pounds. That was way over budget. Rennie's aqueduct not only crosses the loom, but also the newly created River Loon Millennium Park Walk. It's about three miles along the tarmac riverside footpath to Crookaloon. That's one of the most delightful spots in Lancashire, if not in England. The canal now turns southwest and heads out towards Morecambe Bay before turning north again. Swans usually raise between two and five cygnets, so it's quite unusual to see a family as large as this. We counted eight youngsters. 
At Hest Bank, the canal runs very near to Morecambe Bay. Before the Glasson branch was built in 1826, goods were transshipped here between sailing boats in the bay and canal barges. In days gone by, they used to run coaches across the sands at low tide to grange over sands. You can still walk across today, but you need to take a guide. There are quicksands, river crossings and a high risk of getting caught out by the tide. The Hestbank Hotel lay on that coaching route. A light in the window would guide the coachman at night. In 1965, nine coaches were derailed and overturned here from a 70 mile per hour express train. Four coaches gouged into the station platform, but miraculously none of the 115 passengers died. But the station no longer exists. Between Hestbank and Bolton Le Sands, there are fabulous views across Morecambe Bay. The swing bridge at Hatlix is normally closed to the canal, but on our approach, a young lad very kindly opened it for us. Good morning, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bolton Le Sands is a former fishing village. These days, it's more of an equestrian centre. The packet boat in was one of the boarding points for the service. The view over to the west changes subtly now as the Lakeland Hills become more dominant. There's another lime kiln site and the bedstones from its tramway have been upended to make a wall. At Carnforth there's a large basin with a boatyard on the off side. The Canal Turn pub has a range of car scales and an extensive menu, but do book, especially at weekends. Carnforth has always been an important railway town. The present station is the result of a rejuvenation project started in the year 2000. The station and its clock were used in the filming of the 1945 film Brief Encounters. Heading north from Carnforth, the canal passes under the racket of the M6 and the motorway feeder road. Almost immediately, it veers away from the motorway and is back in open countryside with more of those wonderful views. A converted farmhouse looks over the River Keir and the aqueduct carrying the canal across it. The Cape and Ray Canal arm provided access into Webbers, one of the major limestone quarries on the canal. The new floating moorings make this an ideal stopping point in what is known locally as Lover's Creek. Warwick Hall doesn't look much from the canal, but it's an Elizabethan manor house 
built around a defensive Peel Tower. Charles II stayed here in 1651 when his army was camped in a nearby field. The canal terminates rather noisily here at Tewitfield Basin, right alongside the M6. It's been the terminus since it was severed by the construction of the motorway in 1968. However, some 200 years ago, it was also the terminus for round about 20 years between the opening of the section from Preston through to here and the so-called Northern Reaches from here through to Kendal in 1819. Recently, there have been various proposals to reopen the Northern Reaches. I'm joined now by Claire Chapman, who is Marketing Manager for the Lancaster Canal. Hello, Claire. Hi. Claire, is it realistic to be talking about opening the Northern Reaches? Oh, most definitely, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the scheme is, is basically, it's really taken off in the past few years. People have, in the past, thought well maybe it might not happen but but really with with the interest in the formation of the northern reaches restoration group there's so many people that want to see it happening it's got a huge popular following around and locally and what's the current status of the project Right, at the moment, the Northern Reaches Restoration Group that we refer to is um, it's a body of nine partners. We're fundraising at the moment, we're talking to the funding agents, we're doing a lot of publicity and promotions about the scheme and generally campaigning to get it open again as soon as possible. What sort of order of cost are we looking at? Right, well, the scheme itself is, is budgeted at the moment at about 56 million. There's a number of options of routes that we can go down, but, but that's the, the general cost that we're looking at. Obviously, we're going to have to find that money somewhere. Um, Northwest Development Agency, we're hoping, we are going to back the scheme. They've certainly expressed an awful lot of interest, particularly in the wake of foot and mouth, and um, we're hoping that Heritage Lottery will give us some money. It's basically a mixture of public and private funding that we're looking for. For. Claire, what all the boaters are desperately keen to know is how are you going to cross the M6? Right, the, the motorway, the M6 motorway, actually crosses the canal three times. Um, once is just, we're at Stewart Field at the moment, once is just up the road. Um, that one's fairly easy because we've got eight derelict locks, so what we'll do is we'll move the top lock over to the other side of the road, keep the level low. Um, the M6 crossing at home presents a bit more of a problem because you've got pretty much same levels. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to recut slightly until there's enough of a height difference to go under the motorway. One option was to put a drop lock in, but with the ongoing maintenance uh, issues surrounding that, it's, it's not really ideal, it'd have to be back pumped, so not brilliant. So we'll push, probably just divert. And then the one up at Crooklands is a, essentially not a huge problem again. There's, a, there's actually, the motorway's quite a lot higher, so we'll just go straight under. Now, I guess it's too soon to be talking about a time scale, isn't it? No, we're really hoping, it, hoping that it'll be opened for um, 2009. So, if I come up here with my boat in uh, 2009, up the Millennium River Link, uh, will I be able to sail right through to Kendall? Ah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll get real, real canal rage here, boat rage, because people get to Chewitfield and they want to keep going. So, we're doing our best, we're doing our best. Absolutely. Claire, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The eight Tewitfield locks are the only ones on the 57-mile main line. When the packet boats arrived at the foot of the locks, the passengers had to disembark, walk up the locks and get into another boat waiting at the top to continue their journey. This enabled the horse-drawn boats to maintain their average speed of 10 miles an hour. Up on those northern reaches at Crooklands, the Lancaster Canal Trust has restored the tiny stable and they operate the narrowboat water which from here as a trip boat. Further up at Hincaster there's a 380 yard long tunnel whose portals are both listed structures. The tunnel looks to be in good condition. Further up still there's another magnificent aqueduct at Sedgwick where the canal embankment towers over the village. The whole journey along these northern reaches will pass through fabulous scenery. But these northern reaches will, I'm afraid, have to become the subject of a separate video at some time in the future. 
The old black and white is certainly one of the most beautiful and most relaxing canals in the UK. And now that it's joined to the rest of the canal system via the Millennium Ribble Link, we hope that many more people will have the opportunity to enjoy it and to enjoy that warm and friendly welcome that's been afforded to us by the Lancaster Canal Boating Fraternity.